everybody. Uh, nice group. Uh, Tom, my name is Tom Steen with the Capital Area Substance Abuse Council. Uh, today's training is about uh, learning all about um, uh, this, the big health, public health issue that we're having in our state right now, which is um, overdoses by um, heroin or opioids. Um, so today's training is going to really, from the beginning, kind of, I like to say put a frame around the problem so that folks understand why we are where we are now today uh, and then we'll easily move into a, uh, the training mode and how to use what the, uh, the state is now pushing which is the new um, the new applicators for uh, Narcan uh, and in today's um, people who are here today um, will certainly get a Narcan kit um, at the end of the training uh, in hopes that you'll never have to use it, but if you do, uh, you could save a life. And we have uh, a police officer from um, from our finest here today, DJ JP JP. Right? Well, it's close. Not <laughs> JP, where where the a police department and Simsbury is one of the first police departments, my understanding, to really engage in and have an uh available for their officers. So we're uh, pretty excited about having. Police Department uh, represented here today, um, and then I get some extra Narcan over this thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, there we go. And so, uh, anyways, so um, let me begin. Uh, first, uh, um, you know, the, the common name is Narcan. Everybody thinks about this magical reversal drug as Narcan, but really, the, the the prescription is called naloxone. So you'll hear me go between naloxone and Narcan through the training, just so that you know it's the antidote to reverse an opioid overdose. Um, the, the center thing has changed the script, and if you haven't been seeing it yet, you'll see it more and more. Uh, this is the uh, state's response to the opioid crisis, and this is their like, media campaign. Um, if you've been to the movies recently, it's been in the pre-movie slides. Uh, there's a, a big banner, um, a billboard on Route 44 right now. Uh, 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 I know Simsbury was a part of a reach out to all of the uh, pharmacists and, and medical professionals uh, about this whole change the script program and, uh, and the uh, PMP program. So all really positive stuff that's happening across the state. Uh, today's program um, has been um, funded by a grant that the state got here about a year ago as a part of the, uh, of the uh, federal response to the opioid crisis across the state. So it's about a million, five million bucks, um, the five million dollars. So this program is just a small piece of that. And, um, and so today's uh, uh, a program uh, has been sponsored by that along with uh, the cost of uh, being able to distribute Narcan to people that really need it. So, if there's any, uh, any other questions, we'll move right along. Okay, good. So the scope of the prescription drug abuse problem. Oh, prescription drug abuse, I thought this was a heroin problem. Well, no, it started with prescription drugs. And so to understand where we are and why we have such a public health problem is we need to understand where the roots are. Uh, and here's a slide that shows that in the past 30 days uh, among uh, uh, illicit drug users, uh, 12 in order, this is like in the millions kind of thing. And so if you look at the slide, it's, let's see if my pointer works there. Yeah, that's good. Um, most people don't use illicit drugs in our country. Uh, and that's kind of the good news. Um, but for those that do, 6.4% use prescription drugs. And out of that 4.6%, 4 you'll see in this box, 3.8% of them use uh, a pain reliever or a prescription drug. And those are, are Schedule II drugs like um, um, Percocet, Oxycodone, uh, drugs along those lines that are, are painkillers, pain relievers, relievers, um, and such. So, I, and you can see some of the other, they're very small. Um, so, you know, from, from a global perspective, 
well, you know, okay, it doesn't seem to be too bad, um, but as you'll see as the presentation goes on, we've got over a thousand people dying by, um, by accidental overdose uh, by an opioid in our, uh, in our state on an annual basis. So it is a significant problem. Uh, where are the sources of the prescription drugs? And I, you know, I'm, I'm a product of the 70s, so you know, I'm, uh, I'm 64, 30 years old, uh, whatever. Um, you know, I graduated in high school in the 70s, all right? Uh, heroin usage was, was, you know, so I'm an addict under a bridge with a needle, homeless person. Well, that's all changed because of the prescription drug uh, um, um, exposure into our society. And so uh, when you become addicted to prescription drugs, where do you get them? And this is what this slide shows, that free from a friend or relative. Um, I know a few years back my agency did a, a program with real estate agents educating them on talking to their clients to secure their medicine cabinets. Because if you're addicted to an opioid, a real easy place to get it is a medicine cabinet. And if you're at an open house and you're going to the bathroom, where are you going to look? in the medicine cabinet, you'll steal the medications, uh, uh, as well, certainly as a friend just saying, well, if you want this here, you can have it. If you recall, a couple of years ago, this has all changed now, but a couple of years ago, when doctors prescribed an opioid, like uh, oxycodone, you get a three-month supply. You get 90 -day script, a 90-day script, a 90-pill script. You maybe use two or three, four out of the whole script, and the rest sits in your medicine cabinet. Hmm. Problem. The other is prescription uh, from a doctor. We now know that people who have become addicted to opioids, prescription drugs, uh, doctor shop. And so they'll go to one doctor and say, I got this pain, and they'll go to the next doctor and say, I got this pain. Before you know it, they got three or four or five doctors prescribing an opioid to them, which helps them defeat the addiction. So here's the problem, and there's some good news. I will share it with you, um, but this is how it started. This is what caused the problem from the beginning. So you're going to say, well, why would anybody want to take prescription drugs? You know, you know what we know now, we fear, but back, back just a handful of years ago, we were all told the prescription drugs were fine. There was no problem with it. And, and you could read through, the, through this list, people thought they were safe, there were all kinds of reasons about, oh, if the doctor said it was okay to take it, I would take it. We now know, and, and with sati hard statistical data proves that of all the population in the United States, 25% of that population is susceptible keywords, susceptible to addiction. And we, now, we know there's all kinds of addiction out there, but if you think about it, out of that 25% uh, that they are susceptible to uh, addiction, and for the first time in their life, because they blew their knee out or they had a, a tooth pulled, they started to take an opioid, they became addicted. And it got worse and worse and worse. And unfortunately, what we're finding is now people are dying from. It. So this is kind of why it kind of all occurred. Uh, there was no danger involved. So, so, so now we have a person who is, is uh, uh, addicted to an opioid. And oh, you all know what the difference between an opioid and an opiate is? This is classroom time now. What's the difference? An opiate comes from the pocket. That's where heroin comes from. Opioid is made in factory. It's produced. And so your oxycodones, your Percocet, they are all made in the factory. And by the way, you can buy enough equipment and supply and produce that stuff in your own kitchen. If you had a way with them. Unfortunately, that's the reality of it. Also, in, in law enforcement, I'll tell you, it's being shipped into this country from the Middle East and the Far East in large quantities, and, then, and the, the unfortunate part of it, it's untested. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, 
where dosages uh, are changed from uh, supplier to supplier. So, so now, um, if I'm if I'm addicted to an opioid uh, and um, i um, and I'm I'm up to an addiction, say I'm taking I mean, most addicts the 500 milligram, eight, ten pills a day. And those pills are maybe, these are the opioids, are maybe $50 on the black market. And if my, my supply is run out, I have to feed my addiction, where do they go? They go to heroin. So that's the gateway. That's what's occurred. And we now know what's the heroin that's on the street now is laced with things called fentanyl and carfentanyl. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how they put elephants to sleep. They use that stuff. Now, if there is a medical use for it in a, in a control setting, like an operating room, where there's a traumatic, a traumatic, traumatic accident and where um, uh, they, the doctors have to literally put people to sleep to do what they need to do to help get those folks back on recovery. But it's in a very, very controlled state. Well, when you start putting fentanyl in this stuff, um, now you think, well, but the heroin addict who takes five bags of heroin or eight bags of heroin a day um, and, and it feeds and, and it satisfies their addiction um, and then you put a fentanyl in there, it's a hundred times the power. So what happens is an overdose occurs and the most likely, if not intervene quickly, a death. So here's the problem in Connecticut. Um, these are hospital admissions. And I kind of really like this slide because it really kind of shows the depth of the problem. Here, this starts in 2013 and it goes up to 2016. The green bars show the heroin admissions. Look at, they're all going up. 2014, 15, 15, and now 16, 18,000. 324. The bottom bar is the other opioids. You know, that's the, the, the chemicals that are made, like in a factory. Uh, they're going down. There's a reason for that. And it's because our, our society, especially over the past couple of years, has, has begun to control the amount of um, prescription drugs that can be actually written. Uh, and I'll share some of those new laws with you in a few minutes. Uh, but there's a reason for it. And some of the folks I know at the, at the DEA's office in Hartford kind of predicted this a few years ago, because they said as soon as we start controlling prescription drugs, somebody that's got an active addiction to prescription drugs, it's gonna go somewhere else to feed their addiction. And when you talk to uh, drug counselors and uh, folks who are in the treatment, it's the silent addiction. I, I know people who are in recovery who are at the pinnacle of their careers, making hundreds of thousands of dollars that got caught up in this prescription drug. And one gentleman I know <coughs> works in Starbucks now. And it's glad for it because he's alive and he's, and he's on the road to recovery. But it was a hard, hard road uh, to get there. Now, and now it continues to be a hard road as he recovers. So, so this, is, this is a prime example of what has happened and why, why we're seeing all the deaths that we are in our state. So overdoses. Um, here are some of the pop, populations that are, uh, are kind of susceptible to overdose. Um, and you, um, you can read them on the screen. Um, chronic pain patients are, are uh, somebody that needs to take a, a pain medication or because of some sort of medical issue can easily become addicted to it. Um, seniors and baby boomers. How many baby boomers in this room am I on? All right. Because um, we didn't know. When prescription drugs came out, they, we, they, we were told they were fine. Mm -hmm. And then we started taking them. And, then they, and if we're part of that 25% of the population, it can easily fall into it. Uh, Medicare recipients, um, obviously, are because of the population being older and that kind of stuff. So, so, uh, um, so these are just some of the the the, more, the populations that would be more susceptible. This slide it might be a little harder to see, 
but I like it. It's 2015 data. There's some more new data coming up. But the, the numbers in red are the states that are in the top 10. And though Connecticut is 22.1 uh, uh, per 100,000, um, doesn't put us in the top 10, but New Hampshire is number two, um, Pennsylvania is number six, Massachusetts is number seven, Rhode Island is number five. We're surrounded, right? And I submit to you as the 16 data and the 17 data becomes more available, we're gonna be in the top 10. And, there, and, and when you talk, talk to law enforcement and to, and to the federal folks who are dealing with this whole issue, um, it's because the East Coast is the, is the entrance point for the manufacturing from other parts of the country. And it's getting in and it's really hard to police. Um, there are some other reasons to it too, uh, but we're surrounded and we should all be very, very concerned about it and why we're doing this kind of training uh, as a response uh, to the, uh, uh, the overdose scenario here in our state. So in 2016, there were 917 uh, accidental overdoses uh, reported by the chief medical examiner's office. Um, this slide kind of shows you though, uh, and, and as you read it, think about, you hear about on the news or you read in your newspaper about overdoses. You hear about young people overdosing. Guess what? That's not the majority of people dying from overdoses. The majority of it is the white, non-Hispanic man are the folks who are dying from overdoses. And it goes back to my earlier explanation that we that the baby boomers were all exposed to to prescription drugs, not knowing how much of a danger they were. Um, and so and you can see in the bottom side of the screen, 30s and 40s and 50s make up 75% of those dying. But again, think about what you read in, in media now. It's, oh, it's the young person who's died and who's overdosed. Uh, and so that's a key. This surprised me when I learned all about this stuff, because I always thought it was a young person's problem. Nah. Yes, ma'am? Do you think that's because people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that it's sort of hidden? That, like, it, that that's the cause of death? <clears throat> Let me see if I understand your question again. Like, like, why don't we hear more about people in their 40s and 50s ODing? Do, do you think it's because families say, like, keep it quiet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. You know, this, this is reported data from the chief examiner's office. But, you know, and, you know, mm -hmm. I think media, you know, the young person, the dramatic oh, young person. Um, the other part of this, 917 people is, is accidental death or overdose. I know some folks over at the Chief Medical Examiner's Office, and when somebody dies, um, um, you know, it's an untimely death. Um, many times there's a, a the investigation goes down, they call it a psychological evaluation or an investigation to figure out what was going on with that person's life, um, you know, two to three weeks prior to the death. Um, they've, the chief medical examiner's office has so many uh, accidental overdoses, they don't have enough time to go back and to look. And so I submit to you, the, the, um, a young person who, and this is through um, uh, first responders who have told me who have done a reversal with, a, a, with Narcan with an overdose, a person wakes up and says, I'm still alive. So what's that telling us? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it, could it be a suicide attempt? We don't know. We don't have enough time because there's so many deaths. You know, I, they're working on it now, but they have trailer trucks, they have refrigerated trailer trucks behind our chief medical examiner's office because there's not enough room for all the I folks who are dying for this. So, so it's a real problem, and and. And, and it's a resource issue, and we all know about our state's budget problems. So, um, but it's the older people there. Older people, I shouldn't say that, it puts me as an older person, right? Um, but it, it's, it's not the young people. 
I, I submit to you that young people are figuring it out pretty quick. Unfortunately, there are some because 25% of our population is susceptible to addiction and, and those, these young people can easily fall in and into that addiction if they don't have the right education and tools and, and, and support me mechanisms in place to know that um, this stuff can be really dangerous. So here's the typical um, overdose victim in Connecticut for the Chief Medical Examiner's <coughs> Office. Non-Hispanic, white male, 33. Well, who would believe this? I mean, I didn't know when I first saw it. So it should be uh, something which you can think about. Um, the other thing that this slide shares, and that last sentence is, uh, and when you talk to people who are in recovery um, for this kind of addiction, um, are never in the addiction alone. Mm -hmm. They always have two or three friends. And they can support each other, and, and some of my uh, friends with the, the Hartford Police Department will tell you they've made raids into into what they used to call heroin dens back in my day. But their apartment buildings were people are getting high in heroin. What do they find on the find on the antique the coffee tables? One person is the designated not person getting high. So if somebody has an overdose. Unfortunately, but that's what's going on. So that's it's a real problem, and and so to, so to know it's older it's it's an older age group, not a younger one. So here's the type of naloxone that's on the on the market right now. Uh, so I'd like to show this slide just so that folks kind of understand um, what's out there, what what's being used. This first one um, is the injectable naloxone. This is if if, there, if there's a reversal of an overdose um, here in Simsbury um, because the person's at risk for himself or of others will be immediately transported to the hospital after a reversal, they will begin to give them nar uh, Narcan intravenously and slowly but surely bring it down so that the person doesn't go into withdrawals uh, from, from, uh, from their overdose. Uh, this setup was what used to be out there in the field and in some police departments are now changed and fire departments are now changing over this comes in three parts so if you had somebody who was in, in an overdose you have to put part a to part b to part c before you can actually um, do the injection um, or, or use the applicator this bottom one is it's like an epi pin for naloxone uh, it's like two to three hundred dollars uh, a dose, a four milligram dose. Uh, it's out there, and I happen to know some families who, who have made the financial uh, decision to purchase them because they're so worried about somebody, in, uh, you know, in their household or, or a family member that they're concerned about. This last one is um, what is now the state is now pushing um, through the Department of Health, Department of Mental Health and Addictive Services. Well, I'm going to be passing these around in a minute, but here it is. It's, this is the naloxone of the Narcan adopter. And there's a plunger on the bottom of it, and you sim simply push the plunger in, pushes the spray out of the applicator uh, into the nostril, and the Narcan's been in, in, administered. Pretty simple. And I just, at the beginning today, uh, the police officer today has just shared with this is what our, our police officers and firefighters are using here in Simsbury, which I'm pleased to hear. So, so there is today's training. You're going to learn how to use this applicator. And very simple, very easy steps to learn. Um, but this is what's out there. This is what, what you should know about it. intravenously and then um, and then uh, uh, the, the spray applicator. Naloxone. It is a prescription medication. I submit to you in the next year or two it will not be. Because this stuff is, you know, they're worried that there's any contra, uh, contra stuff going on with the medication. You know, as new medication becomes more and more available to use, God forbid something was negative to it. but. At this point, it's clearly a safe medication. Um, 
But right now, there's a prescription. So I, I, there's a standing order through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services that allows me as a trained, tr a trained presenter to um, distribute this medication. Um, so, you know, it takes a standing order. More about that, there's a, there are other ways to get it that are very easy. Um, I, it, it affects persons with opioids in their system. Uh, only opioids, and, and you can't get high from it, you can't get addicted from it. It's clearly a safe, safe um, medication to use when somebody, whether you think they're having an overdose or not, if the person's not having an overdose and you administer, it's not going to hurt. Not going to hurt. More about that in a minute. Um, how does Narcan work? All right, this is now, we're going to really confuse you all because we're going to give you my little science demonstration on how it works. In your brain, you have brain receptors. Brain receptor here, brain receptor there. And in between the receptor, there is, um, you know, chemicals. There's, it's a solution, if you will, uh, of hormones and things that your body naturally produces. What happens when you start taking an opioid or an opioid like heroin, that, that that artificial or that outside chemical begins to replace chemicals like serotonin. There's a whole list. It's really long. You don't want. It'll bore you to death. Uh, but trust me, your body naturally makes this stuff, keeps your mood easy, everything's cool, right? Uh, but when you start entering this outside stuff to it, your body shuts down making the natural stuff. And so now your body craves the opioid or the opioid. Craves it, needs it. And what happens in an overdose scenario is the opioid opiate attaches itself to the receptors and the receptors start firing. And when your brain stops working, what happens? You stop breathing, all of your natural systems like heart rate, and slowly but surely shuts down. So when I was growing up, when you watch the TV or the movies, a heroin addict was like in a rage, in a fit, uh, uh, going through an overdose. No, people who die from an overdose literally fall asleep and die because the body shuts down. The, the brain receptors stop firing. So now we have Narcan or naloxone. When you administer the naloxone, what it does is, right, all of that, all of that opioid, opioid is stuck on the receptors, it throws it off. So when, you know, when first responders will tell you is when you administer somebody in the, in the throes of an overdose, they literally just wake up. What happened? Like nothing, nothing went wrong. What happened? Um, you know, and more to come about that because it becomes a little bit more complicated when you reverse somebody from from uh, uh, from an overdose. But it literally, they literally just wake up. That's because that the opioid is thrown off the receptor and the brain starts firing again. Okay, simple kind of uh, presentation to it all. Um, it'll work for 30 to 90 minutes, uh, or it, it, it literally will, um, um, it will, it, I should step back a minute, it, it'll, it'll work within minutes. Uh, and, and if you don't get the overdose to, or, or get the Narcan and throws it off in 30, 60, 90 minutes of not breathing or resuming breathing is when the death occurs. So when people, People die from overdoses, and I, I don't know, a police officer might want to jump in and share, but many times it, it, they're dying sitting in a chair in the bedroom or on the foot of a bed or in a car because they've just gotten their dose and, and first responders respond and they find them uh, you know, draped over their, uh, uh, their uh, steering wheel. Um, uh, it's, it's not where you think people are. And remember, it's the silent addiction. We don't know in a lot of cases that folks are addicted to this stuff. And so it becomes a, it becomes a very, very surprising, and very, very um, devastating reality um, when somebody does 
overdose from one of this stuff. Uh, it works on any opioid, so on an opioid or an opiate, so heroin or, or, or the prescription drugs. Works on both. Okay? I worked really hard to simplify that because <laughs> our librarian would well, know it's very complicated chemistry, and I'm sorry, I'm not smart enough for that. Um, Here's how you identify an overdose, and this is a really kind of important slide because you know, as as good um, as good Samaritans in the community, uh, we have an Arcan kit, and we come across somebody. Um, it, it's important to try to figure out what's going on, um, how to distinguish between a heart attack and an overdose. So the first thing you look for. Is, is unresponsive or minimal response. They're just laying there, you're yelling at them, and they're not moving. The face is gray or blue because, right, the body's functions are shutting down, so they're not breathing enough, so they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, the shallow breathing, snoring, loud gurgling sound is another thing. And, and when I've talked talk to a lot of the first responders that I've done this training with, it's those pin, pinpoint pupils. Uh, in the eyes, and from a from from somebody that who's trained to do that, that might be an easier way to distinguish. But for for a good Samaritan, maybe maybe not. We're probably more along the lines of the deep gurgling or the very shallow breathing. The difference between a heart attack and somebody that's in an overdose. Somebody's in an overdose still has a heartbeat. They're very faint, but you can still pick one up. Um, somebody's in a heart attack. There is no, there is no heart rate, and like the like the library here is an EAD machine, and those those things are lifesaver kind of things um, that can help that ascertain what's going on. But that's kind of a key thing to know, um, and obviously other evidence. I mean, um, police officer I know now retired from Arthur Hotel. <laughs> you just walk in and you can see evidence. You know that there's. Um, um, that there's opioids or, or, or heroin being used on the scene. Um, so here's how you try to arouse them, you yell at them. Um, have you ever had anybody take their knuckles and go up right up on the back of your back of your spine? The first thing you're gonna go is like this. Well, somebody's in an overdose. <clears throat> Not no affect. What I was gonna ask was how long does it typically take? happen or does it depend on how much they've taken or the person from when they've taken their dose to when they're out or overdosed? The, the, the normal, yeah. it, it depends on how deep um, the overdose is and how much um, of the illicit drug they've taken. Um, sometimes it's like literally immediate and sometimes it takes a second dose and then the first responders show up and I'll share more about that in a, in a couple more slides, but it depends. It depends. A good question. Um, so, you know, this they say, if no response, call 911. Ladies and gentlemen, call 911 first. Mm. All right, we're good Samaritans. We got folks that are highly trained to deal with this stuff. The 911 operators know how to talk you through this. If you come across someone and you think they're having an overdose, the first thing you have to do is call 911. There's a few reasons for that. Number one, they can talk you through it. You're not going to remember Tom's program six months from now when you, when you, when you, and you know, think about how nervous you would be when you're looking at somebody that's that's clearly in trouble or you know, potentially near death. Um, I mean, that's kind of a, like a nervous, emotional place to be, right? So having that 911 operator walk you through it, educate, you know, kind of get your memory brain going, they'll ask the right questions. The other thing is, they're gonna send somebody to you right away. And you're gonna want them, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So you really wanna call 911 first. They'll walk you through some of this stuff. They'll, they'll say, check their breath, check this, check, just as, We've got, we've got a crew coming to you. Just stay, stay put, and, and they'll ask you, do you have an Arcan kit? You know, and, and, uh, and certainly I'm hoping that you'll be able to do the affirmative, like, yes, I'm prepared, um, which um, can certainly help save a life. But always call 911 first. This is really should be this up here, but this, 
was developed by my trainer, and I'm protecting her slides. I would not have to change her slides. So um, I would call 911. Uh, I'm a retired Y director. I, I had four saves in my career, uh, three with CPR, one with EAD machine. And the first thing I did in 04 was call 911 first because there's a pass, there's a warm pass in between when, they, when, they're, when, when you are immediately responding and when, and when they show up in this thing. And here in Simsbury, they, there's quick response rates, you know, two, three, four minutes, they're here helping you. So always call 911. Um, here are some things that you should tell, and, and, and a good operator will, will get this information out of you, um, describing exactly what's happening. Because with, what the operator is doing is now communicating to the, to the team that's on their way. Here's what's happening, this is what's going on in the scene, so when they do arrive on the scene, they can act, and they can act immediately. So now that you've ascertained that you have, you're facing somebody who is in the throes of an overdose, and you're going to and you're going to begin to do, uh, you're going to, and the the 911 operator says if you have a, a, a Narcan kit, yes, administer the Narcan. So I'm going to pass these around. Some of these things are sticking, so you know, they've been used quite a bit. Um, this is these are testers. Um, so if you're um, I'm going to keep this third one here. So here, here's how you, here's how you administer Narcan. Very, very simple. Remember how I said that when, um, when you come on scene, many times they're in a chair or they're sitting on the edge of the bed or in the car. You want to get them out onto the ground and on their back. Um, you do not want to try to administer this stuff while they're stroop stooped over a chair or, or um, in a position where you, you can't, you, the, the Narcan can't be used the most efficient. It's on their back. What you do is you put your hand up behind their head, lift up, and if you have one, you're going to put one of these on. This is a glove, surgical glove, and everybody will get one of these tonight before you leave. You know? um, and there's a reason for that. You tilt the head back, you, you insert the injector just inside the nose. You don't have to go all the way to the moon. All right, just inside. There's reasons why I might do that. Just inside the nose, and you're going to press the applicator all the way in. And when you do that, uh, the plunger will push all the air can into the nostril, and it will stay in. The, the units that you're practicing with now spring back because it, it's for training purposes. Uh, and that's when you'll know that all of the Narcan has been administered into the nostril. Doesn't matter what nostril that you use, you have the head tilt back, you're, you're just inside the nostril, and, um, and then you press the plunger. The reason why you want to maybe have a glove on is because if most people who have addiction to an opioid or heroin now, um, for the most part, not all the time, for the most part, are snorting. So if the person who's having an overdose just snorted heroin laced with fentanyl, and there's fet and it's, some of that's on the nostril, and your finger touches it, um, you're, you're going to the hospital next. <laughs> and I've talked to police officers that have that, and the police dogs that that's happened to, where it just, it literally just touching it. It crosses over, gets in the system, and makes you sick. And so I don't want to scare folks. Uh, and, if, and when in doubt, I would administer it, but I'd be very careful not to touch the nostril. That's why when I train folks, it's just inside the nostril. And it'll cross the memory, it'll get into the system. Um, and, you know, I, one person, uh, shared with me a story where they had the, the, the old style with the three pieces and they literally pushed the thing up the person's nose and the person's nose started to bleed. You don't need to do that. Just, just inside the nostril, press the plunger, push the an Arcan into the nostril, and then, uh, and then release. So everybody will get one of these. I'll show you how to store it uh, towards the end. But that's 
that's how that's how you administer healthcare. Person on the back, hand up. If you've done CPR, you know you always want to get CPR. You want to head, tilt the head back um, and administer the Narcan. Uh, I mean, you can see, and, and you're all going to get the exact kit that's on this screen here. It's the same uh, manufacturer and, and applicator. So now you've done it, you've done it. And remember I said earlier that many times reversals will happen within two to three minutes. Um, the one thing you want to do is you want to move them to the, uh, what they call the rescue position. You want to move them to their side. Um, this, and uh, as I said earlier, you know, if, if respiratory system is beginning to shut down, there's gurgling, you don't want the, the airway to get clogged with anything. You want to get them over to the side, and you want them to be facing away from you. Not facing to you, but facing away from you. Um, and the reason why is many times when you administer Narcan, the person throws up. And it's not pretty. And you don't want any of that on you. So just place them on the side. If the person doesn't respond in two or three minutes, remember you're on the call with the 911 operator, the 911 operator will say, go ahead and roll them back on the back and give them a second dose of four milligrams. Uh, uh, the standing orders that uh, connect with air, you're allowed to give two doses based on the 911 operator or your own decision. Basically, you're not, if you don't have a 911 operator, you're, and you're administering the Narcan. The standing orders, you're allowed to do two doses. Um, they, uh, when the first responders show up, they can give additional doses. And the max is 10. Max is 10. I just want to 10 say, doses? You, you can go up to uh, 10 uh, or 40 milligrams. Um, I was pretty surprised about that, too. Yeah. And I understand it's happened, too, in this state. And it's because of how deep the addiction, how dip, deep the overdose is. And it's taken that much more Narcan to kind of throw the stuff off the, the receptors to get the person revived. Um, but for us, and for our, our purposes as community, community um, folks or, or, or Good Samaritans, uh, two is enough. Because after two, I mean, roll them back onto their side, facing away from you. Um, uh, you know, at that point, it's really up to the professionals to decide what to do next. Here's a key slide, a couple of key points on the slide is, you know, you see the two, three minutes. But, but one thing is when, the, when they do um, uh, re get revived from the overdose, they're very agitated. They immediately go in with withdraw. And, it, and here's the other reason why you want to call 911 first, because if you get a reversal, then you know uh, Simsbury police, Simsbury firefighters will show up, and they're more prepared to deal with anybody that's that's being agitated. I did a did one of these trainings in Bristol, and one of the um, firefighters there you knows a New York City policeman had given somebody a. a, a, a a Narcan uh, dose to reverse a minor overdose, and the person came right out out of it, swinging you know, right in the, in the nose, mm -hmm. broke his nose, and and the cop was like, "It's my fault. I was better trained, knew that this was going to happen." And so, I, and he's, you know, the cop gentleman gave me permission to share the story. Uh, very aggravated. Remember, it's the hidden addiction. So you think about it. Say it's a, a high-end executive who is now being reversed, or, or a prominent person in the community, or somebody like that, who's just now been reversed from an overdose of an opioid, they've just been out. They embarrass and think about all of those the emotions connected with that, and the denials that will certainly come out. Um, um, all police departments now, on, on any reversal of an opioid, go to the, go to the emergency room because you know, this is part of the law that if you're at risk for catches for yourself or others you go. It's none of this, oh no no I'm fine, I'm fine, it's no we go. 
problem is they can get to the hospital and within a few hours they're released. And I, I don't know about Simsbury, but I know some other police departments, they're showing up eight hours later, giving an American dose again to the same person. So it's a real problem. And, and you know, as a community, we, we gotta do our best to have the tools in people's hands so that when something like this occurs, um, we can get them to help that they need and then, um, uh, and in most cases, in, in, in our state, there's, uh, there are now recovery coaches in all the hospitals. These are non-hospital employees, most, some of, most of which are in recovery themselves. And it's just what they say, it's coaching. Saying, hey man, I've been down this road before, there's a place to get help, let me help you, let me point you in the right direction. And that's a positive thing in our community. We just, just in the past year, they've rolled out. I know some folks that are a part of the program. And they've got like 97% uh, effectiveness rate, where somebody who's talked to a recovery coach follows up and gets some sort of treatment afterwards. So if that's the case, well, we need to use it for sure. So um, um, I know St. Francis, the closest hospital to us here in Simsbury, has recovery coaches. Out. So. Um, it says it should be monitored for at least one hour. Anybody that's reversed by an overdose with Narcan goes to the hospital, period. Whether you're under 18 or over 18, you're gone. And that's that, because Tom said so. Um, here are the, the, the new laws connected with, um, with this whole opioid overdose process. And, and so, I, you know, there's a lot of gobbledygook on here. Um, but um, Narcan can be prescribed to anyone. Um, it can be administered, uh, you know, without with protected from civil liability and criminal prosecution. Um, so, so they were positive. Under this this um, law, uh, uh, physicians are now allowed to prescribe um, Narcan. So if a, a family here in Simsbury missed today and hasn't been able to get a Narcan kit. Um, and I'll, I'll provide these slides for the, um, for the television show um, with the information on it. Um, the, the, uh, the CBS pharmacy has a, has a pharmacist that can uh, write a script for a family to get Narcan. Uh, you have to call ahead because not all the pharmacists are registered for it. I happen to know here in Simsbury they are. Uh, they cost anywhere from 115 to uh, 220. Um, this one we brought in bulk and it cost 75. Uh, that you're all going to get tonight um, with the two doses in the box. Uh, but you can get it. You don't have to go see a physician. Uh, the other key um, uh, changes in the law, and this is where the DEA folks I talked about earlier today that I know in Hartford kind of knew that, kind of sensed this problem is going to occur. To uh, two, three years ago. Now they limit the amount of medication that a, uh, that a physician can write. So they can only write up to a seven day script for um, opioid. Uh, and in some cases, 30 day script um, when, there's, when, when it's in the right kind of scenario where somebody has, um, uh, what's the word? They have ongoing uh, struggles with pain. Uh, there, um, but there's no more 90-day scripts. And, and uh, the, the insurance, insurers here in Connecticut have to, are, are um, legally required to follow. The other thing is called, they call it the CPMRS. You know, I, I hate acronyms. I have nightmares with acronyms. They call it early on the Prescription Monitoring Program, PMP. Any registered pharmacist who's writing a script for um, a Schedule II or Schedule I drug has to go into a database, put your personal information in there, and if they see you've already got a script for, um, uh, for um, Percocet, by law they're, not, they're required not to fill the script and they are required to report it. And what happens is then, Department of Public Health goes after the physician who's writing. And that's the doctor shopping thing. 
And I happened to my dentist told me a story that he got a letter only because he had written a seven day script, but some other doctor was writing a whole bunch of other scripts for the same patient. And we've got to stop that. So, um, so an important part of, um, part of what we do is this, uh, the PM3 program or the CPMRS program. Or whatever. Okay. Uh, just know that your physician, when you get a script for an opioid from your doctor, uh, it goes into a database. The other thing about um, going to purchase a, a Narcan kit from a pharmacist, and if you use your insurance to purchase it, just know that when you go to your next doctor's appointment, your doctor's going to know you got that script. It shows up on the databases. And, and, and I've known a few people who have said, who have loved ones who struggle with this kind of addiction, who said, you know what, I'm going to go and get one. They went and got one, and then they went to their annual physical, and the doctor's like, eh, no, I see you got a script for Narcan. Uh, want to share it with me a little bit? <laughs> and it was like, and the folks that, who shared this with me, it's just like, you've then had to share with that. Well, I've got a loved one that's in trouble, about da, 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 not necessarily for me. But just know that. I mean, just you know, you know, being up and up and honest and forth. If you have somebody in your family that's in trouble, and you don't have an Narcan kit, uh, and you can't get it, go and get one. And don't worry, you can tell the story, and, and it'll be cool. Um, most insurance covers insurance companies will cover it, um, given whatever your deductible is. Um, there's some that don't, so be forewarned. And again, it's, I believe um, CBS is this, this exact kit is 115 bucks. So, the next step is the Narcan kit's material. You, in the state of Connecticut, unlike other states, other states sell a, a Narcan kit that actually includes the Narcan kit in it, and it has the gloves, and it has you know, alcohol sw swabs, it has a health guard, um, it has all kinds of other things, instructions, and you can buy these. They're available at your local pharmacies without the Narcan kit in them, but I have a much cheaper way. Um, go into your kitchen and get one of those Ziploc bags out of your kitchen, and what you're gonna do with your new Narcan kit, is you're gonna open that Ziploc bag, and you're gonna put your glove in there, and then you're going to open your box and you're going to tear up the bottom because there's an expiration date and you want to keep that. And then uh, you have a cheat sheet. I just gave you all this Narcan uh, instruction thing because, you know, just in case you forgot what I taught you, um, you can like, fold that in there. And then open this box up and take the two little, there's two of these in the kit. Just drop them in. Zip the lock band closed, put it in your pocket book, put it in your man bag, put it in your brief kit, it's supposed to be a man bag, it's supposed to have a bag. <laughs> um, uh, you know, your briefcase, you know, any, any place where you feel more comfortable, first aid kit here at the library, um, you know, any of the agencies might want to have, you know, the social services might want to have it in there, because you never know. You just never know. So, um, you don't have to go buying the kit, it's, you know, not very easy. Ziploc bag works perfect. I'm sure that you all have, the police department has it in there. Um, first aid kit or response kit. Yeah, we have a whole, whole big backpack. Backpack that you can Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so again, it kind of gives you an idea on how to do it. Sir? Is there a temperature sensitivity? If you're in a hot car, if it's, I'm thinking it's a, car also. I yeah, know. right. Uh -huh. The next slide. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yes, uh, the the older Narcan was very susceptible to heat, uh, and I remember a few years back the local prevention council through uh, social service department asked to use some of their funding from my agency to purchase those little. They were lit, like little coolers that plugged into the the cigarette lighter thing. Um, they kept the Narcan cool in the, in the uh, squad cars, uh, that's what they call them still. Um, 
Um, but now then you don't need to do that. You don't need to refrigerate it, moderate temperature out of the sunlight. Um, you do not want to put them in the glove compartment in your car. Because why? Um, sometimes it gets to be 120, 130 degrees in your car, and sometimes it's below zero. And those extremes will ruin the, ruin the Narcan. Um, so you want a place, common place, where, where the, the temperature is pretty stable. Uh, the Narcan kits that we're distributing today have a um, 2019 expiration date, September 2019. Probably go two or three months after that, but then from there, you, um, you should uh, um, dispose of it. Uh, this question has come up before. Um, we have a drop box at the police department here at Simsbury to get rid of, uh, and say your Narcan has expired and you don't want to do with it. Uh, you can't put this in your drop box because it's liquid. You no know, liquids are allowed in the drop box. Uh, it's a spray with it, you get but my point. So here's what you do. You just walk outside and hold it up in the air, dispense it, get it in the atmosphere, and then throw this away. Most of our garbage is incinerated anyway now. So um, that's how that's the best way to get rid of an expired dose. Now, psh, don't do it in the house. <laughs> there's a there's a trainer that does this Narcan training out of Hartford. I'm not going to out him because he gets mad at me when I when I out him. But he he what likes to show how safe this stuff is. He takes a live kit and sprays it in his mouth. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, that's. Um, that's how you d dispose of anything that is, has been expired. Um, the other sheet I, I had for you, and I, we'll try to get this up on the, um, on the, uh, um, on the video for, for uh, Simsbury TV, but the, here are some pretty significant resources. The first one is the Demas website that has a link for um, all that's happening with the state's response to the uh, opioid crisis. You can find more about change the script promotions and such. Um, there's downloadable things and, um, uh, that you can use uh, to help promote it. The second is the Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, they're located right in Hartford. Um, Mark Jenkins is the executive director. They have an Arcan training every Thursday. So if somebody's missed tonight and really wants to get the month, you go online, get a contact mark, uh, and get a spot, uh, get a spot in one of his trains. 211, 211 is a real service in this Connecticut, in the state of Connecticut, where there's always a social worker on, on, uh, on, on duty 24-7. If you're concerned about somebody you think maybe is having an addiction issue with opioids, you want to talk to a pro, or you have a you have a friend that is, and you've convinced them they need to talk to somebody, go to a one. You get a pro right on the line. Uh, and what they will do then is direct you to this 8100 number. This is the Demas helpline. Uh, if you call this number, uh, within 24 hours, they'll get a uh, appointment for the person who's struggling to a counselor. It's not perfect. But it's, it's working and it's getting better. It's very important, 8100. Because that's been a problem in our state. Somebody uh, comes clean about their addiction, then what do you do? Um, and uh, um, this 8100 number as well, oh, actually, it comes out on this, this, this website. There's a link there that shows available beds for treatment centers now. And, it, and it's a live number, though. Uh, I tested it here a couple months ago, and one of the treatment centers had eight beds uh, on the on the website. When I called, they had no beds, and and it's like, well, the website said you had eight, and now you're telling me you had, had no beds. It's just, that's because we've had eight admissions. Uh, that's what's happened. So. Um, Here's the link for um, prescribing physicians. You can go on that link and, uh, and put in Simsbury, and boop. Uh, I know the folks over at CVS, uh, some of the uh, pharmacists over there are, because uh, the pharmacists have to um, register to be, 
to, to uh, prescribe naloxone. So, um, so do check that and um, call ahead. There's several over in Avon that have folks. Um, well, well, we, um, they, they have folks too. So, um, so that's a good resource to have. Um, and, and certainly maybe something that, you know, we can put all these links on, on the town's website too, if, if we think that. Uh, um, uh, the town wants to do that, but these are very valuable. And this last person is Susan Buffard, who trained me to do this for you. She works for Dean as PhD. Um, this is her email address, her phone number, if you have any further questions. Um, I think she's got guts putting her phone number down there, but she said, no, no, give it out to everybody, because she really is a true believer. She's the one that created this PowerPoint, this training, um, uh, and she's good people, and she really cares about what's going on. So, um, so there's your resource page. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.